If your house has a wood shake roof on it, you're going to take very good care that it doesn't catch on fire, right? Because such care and watchfulness is going to be a lot better than trying to put out a fire on your roof once it's got started. Prevention is better than cure. The collision shop exists for the purpose of repairing damaged cars. If a driver wishes to do so, he can drive his car recklessly, carelessly, and run it into a ditch or hit a tree even, and have to take it into the shop where it will have to be straightened out. But it's better to drive carefully and thus avoid the accident. Prevention is better than cure. But we often, we often extremely foolish when we fail to take care of our bodies. We carelessly abuse our bodies, just like that reckless driver ruins his car and then he has to look for the repair shop to get things straightened out. We look for the miracle medicine to make us well again in the hospital. But prevention is better than cure. Amen. One's food is a very personal matter. I find that out with my grandson repeatedly. We offer him food and he says no. But then he picks and chooses from our plates whatever he wants to put into his mouth. Food is a very personal matter. And when we get hungry, we would naturally want to eat what we think is satisfying to us. And often personal, even selfish prejudice dictates what we eat. But there are increasing numbers of people who are learning that one's choice of good largely determines health and therefore happiness. Some wait to change until they're forced by disease to do so. And in those cases, appetite has had to give way to the demands of just simply surviving. But others are a little bit more wise. They learn to anticipate the possibility of disease and they have voluntarily changed their eating habits. And they sense that there is a relationship between what they are eating and their health. And there are many different groups who are now living in a preventative way. They prefer a healthful diet because they enjoy just eating simple foods. And often these people have become vegetarians. There's a good reason presented in the Bible why we should control our appetite. Because only when we have healthy bodies, only when we have clear minds, can we appreciate the present work that Jesus is doing for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. We need to have clear minds to comprehend what he wants to teach us from there. Amen. Because he's in his final work of cleansing the sanctuary. He is preparing us as a people for his second coming. So God, Christ, is very interested in your health and in my health too. Now a person may bring disease upon himself through disobeying the laws of health, perhaps through lack of rest or intemperance, uh, lack of pure air or the wrong kind of food or sexual intemperance. He brings disease upon himself and so he gets an injection of a miracle medicine or a miracle drug and, he, and wonder of wonders why he feels well again almost immediately. And so what does he do? He proceeds to do, he goes right back to repeating the mistakes of intemperance that, he made, that made him sick in the first place. Is this God's way of healing? The answer to that is no. For the end result is that the sick man never learns to follow, to believe the laws of God until he goes on so long in transgression that he finally dies of his intemperance and his ignorance. But the Bible has a lot much more to say to us about health in terms of our own personal well-being. The Bible, the Lord wants us to be well and happy as we've read, beloved. I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. You see, our eating and drinking must be controlled by wisdom, by self-rule. The body must not rule the mind. Self-denial and temperance in matters of eating and drinking and other practices 
are necessary if one is going to enjoy good health mentally, physically, and spiritually. The Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 9.27, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so this principle of self-denial, it really is the principle of the cross of Christ. It is the way of a happy and prosperous life. And it is taught throughout all of the Bible. Moses said this in Exodus 15, 26. If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. Amen. Now if one has erred in the past due to his ignorance, the Lord is merciful. Certainly he's gracious to the one who has not known the truth. But we read in Psalm 103 verses 2 and 4, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, so you may have heard health-wise in the past, and who healeth all of thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. He wants to teach you Amen. to stay out of the ditch. Amen. And if we repent of our past mistakes, it's not too late to find new life in following what is right. Again, we read in Deuteronomy 7, verse 12, it shall come to pass, if you hearken to these judgments and keep and do them, that the Lord thy God shall keep unto thee the, the covenant and the mercy, and the Lord will take away from thee all sickness, and will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt which thou knowest upon thee. Amen. Healthful living, that message of healthful living, it's always been a part of the clear everlasting gospel. It's always been part of the third angel's message since the beginning of our Adventist history in the 1840s. Because almost simultaneously with the saints accepting the first knowledge of the 1844 sanctuary message came the uh, simple understanding of what has been known as the health reform message. The principle of the health message at that early time was giving up tobacco and alcoholic drinks. In those days, drugs weren't, drug abuse wasn't a, a noticeable problem then among the early Adventists. But from our beginnings as a people, the reason for the need of a health message was not so much the desire to live longer and enjoy lives more free from suffering as to maintain clearness of mind. So we could comprehend the truths to be associated with the grand Adventist concept of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. And so it was the sanctuary message that was the driving force that made the Adventist message unique and appealing to the remnant who reverenced the Bible. The idea of the cleansing came to be thought integral to living in the antitypical Day of Atonement. And so tobacco was seen as the filthy weed and as defiling the body temple. And so the emphasis on giving up tobacco was not so much uh, fear back then in those days of lung cancer or high blood pressure like it is today or all of the other ills that follow its use today. But the impetus for giving up tobacco and alcohol back in those days was on the idea of the cleansing of the sanctuary. Amen. And there were abundant scriptures that were found on the evils of drunkenness and total abstinence easily became the application of the idea of cleansing in the abandonment of all alcoholic drinks. In the early uh, literature of the church, little is said about the physiological detriments of alcohol or tobacco use. Their use was viewed in light of the cleansing of the sanctuary idea. So in the mid-1800s, 
The health consciousness of the Seventh-day Adventist Church was concentrated on the idea of preparing to see Jesus, the Second Coming. That was the idea. The motivation was not self-centered, as is the popular emphasis on health in our American culture today. The emphasis on health and vegetarianism today in American culture is so that one can keep their body beautiful and live longer and earn a good living. But that wasn't the motivation originally with Adventism. The concern that transcended that kind of self-centered one was getting ready for the soon coming of Jesus and the close of probation. And yet, it's true that the motivation among Adventists was largely Old Covenant, and therefore there was some element of self-centeredness at heart in it, but we have to be honest and recognize that. Fear played a prominent role in health reform, but that is not to suggest that fear is or was a bad motivation for healthful living. It just suggests that there was need for a better motivation for it in order to become more effective truth in practical living. And so that idea of a better motivation was finally to arrive because Jesus was bringing it to the notice of his people through his functioning as our high priest in the most holy place. He was teaching us about the new covenant motivation of God's love and his self-sacrifice on the cross. Amen. That was to become the prominent motivation, getting one's eyes off of self and onto Jesus, to see Him. The Lord Jesus wants to come back soon. He will return soon if His people do not further delay His soon coming, if they will receive the new covenant motivation of His agape love. And our desire is to let the Holy Spirit present to us the wisdom of the great physician in such a way that we may follow his leading in a great reformatory movement among God's people in getting ready in this generation for the final events. Amen. The message on health reform is not one that God sent to us to torment us or to put us under a guilt trip. God didn't intend it that way at all. But it encourages us with that mu much more abounding grace that motivates us to be reconciled to our Lord and His truth. Amen. In that experience of reconciliation with Him, we find the blessed motivation to deny self gladly, to live the health reform message, because we find that self-denial is a joy in Jesus Christ. We actually find a prosperity in Christ. And it's beyond being a burden of guilt on us, that kind of experience. And this is accomplished by a, a simple but powerful health reform truth that is seldom comprehended among his people. The self-denying death that Jesus died on his cross. And yes, it is not the kind of death that popular evangelicalism assumes that it was. The gospel is far greater good news than evangelicals are even capable of seeing what Jesus did on his cross. Jesus, according to the third angel's message in Verity, is he died, he actually died your second death and mine, and not only yours and mine, but for the entire world. That's the motivation for health reform right there. Not until the sinner can grasp that holy truth can he sense the power that is in what Paul calls the truth of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. It, Paul describes it there in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And so Paul exhorts us, he, he begs us, we implore you, he says on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. And if we are, as Christ exhorts us and implores us, we shall also be reconciled to health reform. Amen. That is part of being reconciled to God. So practical is the godliness of Day of Atonement faith that our long-indulged perverted appetites 
can be re-educated to enjoy simple, healthful diet. You're, gonna, you're not going to miss your harmful favorites. To bring Paul up to date, in Galatians 2.20, Christ lives in me and the life which I now live in the flesh, and that is the flesh where appetite rules, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And for Paul, the word flesh included our appetites for food. For he said, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. We must remember Ellen White's classic statement, the health reform I was shown is a part of the third angel's message and is just as closely connected with it as are the arm and hand with the human body. Amen. It's equally true that the health reform is just as closely connected with the third angel's message in verity or in truth. Now I know that fanatics are great enemies of the Holy Spirit, but they don't know it, they're ignorant of it, but sometimes they succeed in turning sincere people away from the most precious truths of God's message. And may the Lord deliver us from doing that. Ellen White cautions us to use care in presenting health reform. She says, among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it. She also said that reforms in general should not be in an excitement or in a rash manner. Going on, great reforms are to be made, but reforms which belong to the future must not be brought into the present. We can all agree that giving up flesh food is surely present truth because disease is prevalent among animals. Uh, but there are some people on the planet who even at present cannot easily procure vegetarian meat substitutes. Yes, there are. We also read the time will come when it will not be best to use milk and eggs, but that time has not yet come. We know that when it does come, the Lord will provide. We are rapidly coming to the time when common sense will say it is now. But we have come to the time when even worldly wisdom is leading us to health reformation. It will not be long, she says, until animal food will be discarded by many besides Seventh-day Adventists. Well, the media tells us, tells us to us all of the time, doesn't it? All of the time. The total abstinence from harmful things is comparatively easy for us in comparison with temptations to intemperate use of foods which are considered proper in moderation. How to train our appetites to interpret moderation in a sanctified way. That is our concern. That is our study. Obviously, we are getting ready for the second coming. We need to live until the Lord comes. That's one aspect of health reform. The very preservation of life itself calls for healthful living. It's true that Ellen White declares that many who are infirm will be laid to rest in the last days. But are you sure that that is the Lord's primary will for you in particular? Does the Lord really want to lay you to rest before he comes? You know, a good prayer for elderly people to pray is Psalm 71. This is an astounding prayer. Verse 8. O Lord, do not cast me off in the time of old age. Do not forsake me when my strength fails. O God, you have taught me from my youth, and to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O oh God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength 
to this generation your power to everyone who is to come. I'm going to send this to my father. He's 97. Some of the words he said to me was, I don't know why the Lord allows me to continue to live. I had my 97th birthday this last summer. This text tells you why the Lord has let him live for 97 years. So that you will have power to declare God's strength to this generation. Wow. The Lord may have a special work for you to do. No matter how old you are. And your old age might be a tremendous asset to you in giving that message. I find that if an older person still has their right mind, and my father still does, Amen. people listen to them. And they don't criticize them so much as they do the younger ones. Because they were, at least there is some respect still for old age. Well, I know that in some quarters that's not true, but I hope it's not true in these quarters. We respect our elders. Seriously, while you are earnestly praying for the Lord to give you a new heart that loves righteousness, will you ask Him to forgive, when you ask Him to forgive you of your sins, you can also ask Him to give you side by side with that a new heart and a new appetite. Artificially prepared food is not what you need. Simple food is what you need. As close as you can come to the Garden of Eden. You can learn to love. You can cooperate with the Holy Spirit on that. There is some medicine I want to share with you briefly. And that is, a merry heart does good like a medicine. But a broken spirit dries the bones. <laughs> There you go, Proverbs 17 and verse 22. A happy heart. You know, there's untold numbers of human hearts that are just broken spirits because they do not understand what Christ accomplished on his cross. And they're not sure that the Lord has accepted them. And there are many Seventh-day Adventists who have innocently accepted the popular doctrine that justification is an offer rather than a gift to all men in Christ. And they understand that it, because, it's, because it's an offer that their salvation depends on their taking the first step in the initiative of their salvation. And they never know if they have taken enough faith in terms of that initiative. And so fear, you know, fear is oppressive to good health, to good mind health. Many grow prematurely old for this reason. The tidings of great joy somehow have never gotten through to their hearts, and it may not be their fault. The message of Christ's righteousness, however, lifts a load of worry from your heart and from mine. Amen. That is very practical. That is prosperity, if you want to call it. I'm not talking about monetary prosperity. I'm talking about good mental health, good body health, practical down-to-earth health reform. It's better than a miracle drug that you take when you have an accident with your health and have to go to the hospital. Understanding that the Lord has forgiven all men, however, does not excuse us from doing all that we can to make wrongs right. And if you owe back tithe or if you owe someone an apology, that worry can be counterproductive to your health reform. Make the choice to obey the Holy Spirit's convincing you of sin, even as it involves the crucifixion of self. And then rejoice with thanksgiving for the much more abounding grace of the Lord. It's all good health reform, folks. The experts don't know yet. All there is to know about heart disease. And yes, let us by all means keep informed of new knowledge that illuminates what we have known by common sense and from the spirit of prophecy. And let us be glad as we follow common sense, a uh, simple, balanced, low-fat, vegetarian diet. But why not do a little Bible study into what God's book might say about this organ of our human heart? Here is a very brief sample. Jacob is a good example of this in the Bible. You know, he almost had a heart attack. 
because he did not believe God's good news truth. There are ten times also that we read about Pharaoh who hardened his heart. He almost had a heart attack. He would have had a heart attack if he hadn't drowned in the Red Sea. <laughs> Friends, kneel alone before the Lord. Let the tears of repentance fall. It's wonderfully good for a hard heart. Turn your mind toward God. Hard hearts can cause hard arteries. Know what it means to let self be melted before the Lord. I don't know of any scientific studies that confirm this, but I am sure that contrition, repentance, can lower your high blood pressure. Amen. Amen. But TV comedies may not be good for a discouraged, darkened heart. Some Proverbs says, even in laughter the heart may sorrow, and in the end of mirth may be grief. Our high pressure lives that are dominated by media, incessant advertising, all of this is bound to be hard on human hearts and opposed to health reform. Isaiah 30, 15, in returning and in rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your strength. A heart that has relinquished its envy for someone else is good health reform. When, one heart, when, when one's heart frets against the Lord, his health is adversely affected. The Lord told Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus that his hatred of him and the Christians, also fretting against him, was hard for his health. He would probably have died of a heart attack if he had not been converted on the road of Damascus when he was. And with the heart, Paul writes, one believes to righteousness, and righteousness is good for the health. For it delivers from early death, and it leads to life. Sing new covenant hymns of heart-melting worship of the Lord. It's good health reform. The purpose of health reform from the beginning I say again, has been to enable God's people to think so clearly that they can follow Jesus Christ in his final ministry, in his most holy apartment. It makes sense to realize that preparing for translation without seeing death will involve a firmer grasp of what our Lord is doing in his ministry in the second apartment of the sanctuary in heaven. There is new light to shine upon us. It stands to reason that if someone is not interested in what his Lord and Savior is doing, he or she is not going to benefit from that special ministry which is progressing just now. You want to be up to date with Jesus in his ministry. We read none but those who have been fortified, who have fortified the mind with the truths of the Bible will stand through the last great conflict. Great controversy, page 593. And in our early days as Adventists, this was recognized. Ellen White, again, you need clear, energetic minds in order to appreciate the exalted character of the truth, to value the atonement. You know, to value the atonement means to comprehend the width and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ revealed at his cross. Amen. And to place, she says, the right estimate upon eternal things. Amen. If you pursue a wrong course and indulge in wrong habits of eating and thereby weaken the intellectual powers, you will not place that high estimate upon salvation and eternal life which will inspire you to conform your life to the life of Christ. You will not make those earnest, self-sacrificing efforts for entire conformity to the will of God. Two out of every three people in the United States are a little over their recommended weight. And the problem is also within the church. And a simple but disturbing question to ask is, will we be happy to see Jesus come 
if we're over our recommended weight. Maybe that's one reason why we hear so little now in the church regarding the soon coming of the Lord. We enjoy a wonderful worship service on Sabbath morning and then we pig out at the potluck because of our great Sabbath dinners. You know, Seventh-day Adventists have a wonderful cuisine. Again, this problem was met in our early days. Servant Lord says, even if you are strict in the quality of your food, do you glorify God in your bodies and spirits, which are His, by partaking of such a quantity of food? Those who place so much food upon the stomach and thus load down nature could not appreciate the truth should they hear it dwelt upon. They could not arouse the benumbed sensibilities of the brain to realize the value of the atonement and the great sacrifice that has been made for fallen man. It is impossible for such to appreciate the great, the precious, and the exceedingly rich reward that is in reserve for the faithful overcomers. The animal part of our nature should never be left to govern the moral and intellectual. Probably all of us have wrestled with this weakness. There's a terrible, practical, down-to-earth problem for many, it is. The relationship then between the flesh and righteousness by faith, that's where the battlefield is. And you will obtain an excellent education in practical godliness kind of health reform. I recommend highly to you Ellen White's Ministry of Healing. Amen. Ministry of Healing. Prevention is much better than the cure. That's the theme of that book. Beautifully written, simple, heartwarming. This book contains the wisdom of the great physician. Amen. I believe it, not only because Ellen White said so, but because I see the evidence throughout its pages. It is good, a good book to read on your knees on health reform. But there is most precious good news. The Lord Jesus in his incarnation took upon his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that we might know how to, that he might know how to give aid to them that are tempted. Jesus has promised to give you aid. I will come to you, he says. I will come to you to convict of sin. He's concerned for you to overcome. And that means that before you can take that second helping when you shouldn't, the Holy Spirit will convict you. Amen. No. Say no. You don't want to clog your mind with sweets that put you to sleep on Sabbath afternoon when you desperately need fellowship with your great high priest who is cleansing his sanctuary just now. You need to learn of him. And so you can't learn of him if you are stupefied in the brain. And if someone wants to overcome, is plagued with alcoholism, the same Holy Spirit will speak conviction before he takes a drink. Or if he's struggling with cigarettes, before he can light up, the Holy Spirit is faithful to convict him or her to say, no, don't do it. You don't need to. And before you and I can go to the refrigerator, when we shouldn't again, the dear loving Lord who is our Savior will bring all things to our remembrance in a conviction of sin. Oh, may the Lord help us. Stop resisting the Holy Spirit. That's what the ancient Jews did. When they stoned Stephen, they resisted the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit tried desperately to save those Jews from committing the nearly unpardonable sin. But by resisting him in health reform today, we may put ourselves back in that group of hate-inspired Jews in the Sanhedrin who brought to an end in self-condemnation their 490 years of probation. Only we are overcoming ever closer to the end of probation. Those will have a part in the closing up of the great controversy between Christ and Satan, will be those who overcome, even as Christ overcame. Yeah. Not merely as a mere honor 
but because the Lord Jesus needs you. He will seat them on his committee. He's going to seat us in his senate, in his heavenly parliament. He says, they will sit with me on my throne. Forget about the great honor involved. Forget about your own crown, wearing it on your head. Be concerned that you have a part in crowning Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. The issue, of course, that's back in the shadows here is a great bride-to-be who has yet to make herself ready for the marriage of the Lamb. And I think we've learned enough in our attempt to study about health reform to realize that it does have something important to do, health reform, with making the bride ready yes. Amen. for Jesus coming.